Great. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. It's a great joy to be here. And thanks to Kenneth for pronouncing my surname correctly. It doesn't happen very often. Sorry? Do you have any video? Um, not with audio. No, that should be good. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I'll be telling you about our work here in Oxford um, on ketamine treatments of depression. And so uh, this talk actually builds on very well on some of the previous speakers, which I'm very happy about. So, first of all, we've heard a little bit about ketamine, but let me kind of introduce the phenom phenomenology of it a little bit better. Hopefully you can see that, that should be repeating. Yeah, um, so, I mean, ketamine, as we've heard about, is a dissociative, and I mean, it's, it's not particularly easy to try and convey kind of what happens uh, during such a trip, but I've, I've tried to include a little bit of a demonstration of that. Um, so, some of the kind of I guess easy to explain effects are things like auditor auditory and visual distortions. Um, those can be quite positive, those can be quite negative, depending on your experience. Closed, out, uh, closed eye hallucinations, especially kind of geometric patterns. But the, some of the most important effects are the kind of internal ones. So things like an altered sense of self. Um, you know, if you go all the way, we have the K hole, which is similar to the M hole in some ways that was described previously. And yeah, and you get kind of a change meaning of percepts and uh, all kinds of strange kind of dissociative uh, phenomena. And the other thing that's also changes is kind of your perception of time, which is hence that Salvatore Dali painting in the corner. So why does this happen, right? That's, that's the kind of first question I'll attempt to answer. So um, this is a relatively complex figure. I'm not going to go into all of the cellular neurophysiology because I'm not a biologist. Um, but I want to talk about it a little bit because, as we've talked about, as some of the previous speakers have mentioned, ketamine is interesting because it's not a traditional uh, serotonergic psychedelic. It, in fact, uh, acts on the NMDA receptors. And very roughly, uh, we think that one of the main mechanisms of action that it has is that um, it blocks um, inhibitory GABA interneurons. So those, that's those ones, the ones in circle. And so basically what that means is if you block the inhibition in the brain, and in fact, most of your, the neurons in your brain are inhibitory, there's a lot more uh, excitatory effects. And so um, in particular, the most prominent excitatory neurotransmitter is glutamate. So you get this kind of glutamate burst, so, so to speak. And that's thought on the kind of molecular cellular mechanism to lead eventually to things like long-term pot potentiation, which can lead to things like uh, increased neuroplasticity and kind of synaptogenesis and all these kind of good things uh, that come afterwards. So in general, basically, it makes the brain uh, easier to excite. But whilst that's kind of relatively well understood on the cellular level, how exactly does that explain why we have, you know, wavy hallucinations and things like that? And for that, we have to move to a slightly different level of explanation. So whilst keeping this one in mind. So the first thing I want to talk about is how it affects the brain oscillations. So we, again, previous speakers have mentioned that uh, using things like the EEG, the electroencephalogram, you can mention the you can measure the electrical activity of the brain, and uh, this comes in kind of different frequencies, and that's what you can see on the figure there. So uh, on the left is kind of just when you're awake. There's a very prominent alpha rhythm around 10 hertz, and uh, the kind of black line is where the ketamine is introduced, and you can see that as the kind of more and more ketamine gets into your system. You can see that that alpha is a little bit disrupted. You get more of that kind of um, lower wave activity. But what's really prominent here is in that corner is higher frequency activity. I can probably point here, um, which we call gamma activity, something around 40 hertz. And, um, and that's thought, uh, that gamma is thought to represent kind of the underlying neuronal spiking pretty well. So hence kind of, you know, increased uh, excitement, increased gamma. And finally, how does that kind of manifest in the kind of mesoscopic or the kind of the whole brain network level, which is some of the stuff more similar to what Andrea and speakers like him were being talking about. And what happens there is, again, we get into these networks that have been mentioned many a time. So, for example, it affects the default mode network, which is thought to be, again, the kind of result of why your sense of self feels very different. And the particularly important region for ketamine seems to be uh, the SGACC, uh, part of the anterior cingulate cortex, which is connected to a bunch of regions of the brain, but in particular, it's associated with processing, uh, processing affect. So, you know, if you experience something, how do you feel about it? Is this a positive, negative experience? So that kind of general emotional processing is affected by ketamine. 
Now, I'm not going to talk about the anesthetic effects of ketamine. In fact, it turns out if you kind of ketamine originally uh, was used and still is used as an anesthetic and in very, very high doses, it makes you basically unconscious. And um, so it does have other effects, like, for example, it also seems to act on the spinal cord. So there's a lot of kind of um, pain relief that you can get from ketamine. But here I'm more interested in the, in the psychedelic effects. So now we've talked a little bit about what ketamine does. If, you know, if some ketamine spawned in front of you and somehow got into your body, what would you experience? And we've also talked about why that may be. But why I'm interested in it, in part, is that, as again was mentioned before, it seems to provide rapid improvements for people with especially treatment-resistant depression. So um, we're working in partnership with the Oxford Ketamine Clinic, and you know you see some of these patients, and like uh, they've uh, so treatment-resistant means they tried at least two antidepressants, and they haven't worked for them, so they have depression kind of you know chronically for a very long, very long time, and they they take ketamine, and kind of you know a few hours later you see uh, significant improvements, which is, you know, really fascinating. However, as one of the previous speakers mentioned, one of the big issues is that you fairly quickly develop tolerance. And uh, that means that very often these patients need higher and higher doses and they become dependent on the substance. And that's one of the last things that we want. And so one of the issues is that at the moment, the treatment is still relatively new and we don't really know where the kind of optimal dose is. And in fact, there is mixed literature so far. Some people hypothesize that the effect of dissociation, some of this kind of psychological effects, may actually mediate the antidepressant effect. Now, um, this is very much an open question. There's about 10 papers on it out there, uh, including two reviews. And basically, everyone concludes, eh, maybe. Uh, you know, if you, if you basically, if you are in the yes camp, you can make very strong theoretical arguments for why that should be the case. If you're in the no camp, you can also make very strong theoretical arguments about why that shouldn't be the case. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a relatively open question. I'm, I'm very happy to kind of not answer that here. But the point is, um, if some of the psychological effects of ketamine are associated with it, it would ideally be helpful if we had some objective markers of, of getting to that. Because especially if you have a patient who's never taken ketamine, they don't know the level of dissociation that they're at, you know? And so that's the thing that we're trying to work on, which is, can we find brain-based measures uh, of dissociation in particular and ketamine experience in general that would um, correlate with the treatment outcome? And so this study is, is in relatively early stages, so I'll just more kind of talk you through the methodology and, and a little bit what we've done so far. And so basically, as I mentioned, we're working with the ketamine clinic, uh, which is really good because, you know, they've kind of, I think they processed their like 100th patient last year. So anyway, so they have a fairly high throughput of patients uh, working within the NHS uh, as a private clinic, uh, still not kind of approved uh, for general treatment. And uh, that means that it's fairly easy for us to kind of slot into that pipeline and hopefully uh, get a relatively high number of subjects. And uh, we'll be also, we'll be using a relatively simple, but clinically useful uh, measuring device, which is normally used for measuring um, brain activity during anesthesia. It's called the BIS monitor. It's that thing in the middle. Basically, it's frontal EEG. And on top of that, we'll also be measuring things like blood levels, and uh, so, so we can get the ketamine concentration, um, even things like about the set and setting, so things like kind of ambient noise levels, whether the patient is listening to music, um, also their kind of heart rate, things like that. And um, on top of that, we have a barrage of kind of psychometric testing, which uh, includes some kind of standard dissociation scales. However, here's my issue with it. Um, so here's an example of what that kind of scale looks like. Uh, you know, you can see you can see some of the questions. Like for example, I feel spaced out. Now imagine that you feel like your ego has just died, and you have experienced all of the history of the universe in a single moment. Rate that on that scale. And so, yeah, so as you can see, I mean, it, we are working with some of these scales because, you know, they have been used by other researchers and it's important for us, for our research to kind of be in that context. But we're still thinking about uh, how to best do this because one of the reasons why there may be such conflicting literature on this is that these scales are very far from perfect. In fact, a lot of them have been developed for PTSD rather than for ketamine. And so basically um, that may mean that they're not best applied. And yeah, and it, and it may also vary kind of like if you get the same patient and they now have a ketamine experience or they know more about the association, maybe the ratings change. 
So, so we are working on kind of optimizing some of these scales. Uh, one thing that we're thinking about is, for example, and if there's any kind of more objective measures in the sense of, uh, like, I don't know, the time perception may be more quantifiable than something as elusive as how dissociated are you. But yeah, and uh, in the kind of last few minutes, I'll just very, very briefly show you something. Um, so this is not actually from our data. This is uh, from an open data set that I uh, found online from some other researchers. But it's um, just, it's very similar to the kind of data that we will be collecting. So it's basically frontal EEG during a ketamine treatment of a young patient with depression. And uh, this time using a commercial device uh, called Hughes, Muse. And uh, just to give you an example of kind of what this looks like. So on top we have the resting uh, frontal EEG activity. You can see a lot of that alpha, that's the kind of main oscillatory rhythm you see there. And ketamine is relatively similar, except you notice these kind of um, little kind of smaller spikes, it's a bit noisier, and that's in fact the gamma activity. And we can look at that kind of on the frequency axis. Um, so it's just some quick analysis I did in preparation for this talk. And you can compare the two states, and you can see that in fact you do find very significant differences, especially in the gamma power. Um, but there's also other interesting things. Uh, for example, it's uh, very clearly also the case that something called the lentils of complexity, which was mentioned earlier, is also increased in ketamine. And so we're looking to kind of look at all of these kinds of both traditional and new markers to, to try and um, see what ketamine does to the brain and how we can monitor it. Um, one thing that I'm particularly excited is about something called uh, empirical mode decomposition, where we can look at the fact that these waves are actually non-sinusoidal. Everyone talks about waves, um, but in fact, there's a very big difference between this wave and this wave, right? And it turns out that quite often, the brain waves are closer to this than that. And the Fourier transform is uh, pretty bad at capturing that, whereas some of these new techniques um, can actually elucidate that. So that's everything I wanted to tell you so far. Thanks to all of my funders, colleagues, and yourself for listening. And I think I may even have a, like a minute or two for a question if anyone has something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so we have one question. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, please go. Uh, so you mentioned uh, as a, maybe a better method, it's okay to use like, mm -hmm. uh, paradigm. Yes, that's re really exciting. Um, so this is in very low stages, and I didn't have time to include it in the presentation, but um, there is a tool that was developed, I think, by the Qualia Institute, where, um, um, so there's, there are tools where, uh, a lot of these drugs produce traces. So if you move your hand, you kind of see the background of that hand. And um, there are tools, like computationally, where it kind of draws you dots and you ask to match uh, the kind of frequency of the dots with what you see. Um, and so that's for traces in particular. And we are thinking whether there is something like that, but for time perception. Uh, we don't have the answer yet, but if there was, that would be really cool. Oh, cool. Yeah, come to the pub and tell me. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Thank you very much, Marco. Um, we are now moving on to the uh, second talk uh, in this session, uh, Whole Brain Modeling for Psychedelic Treatment in Depression by Jakub Voracek. Yeah. Is it being recorded too, if, I, if I'm here? Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Any videos and audio? No, it should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. So let, uh, let get me started. Uh, yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be in person here uh, with all of you. Um, yeah, I would like to share some, some of the work we've been doing on whole brain models and, uh, in, uh, and their use in psychedelic treatment for uh, depression. And of course, as many uh, speakers have said before, it's always a, a joint a collaborative effort. And so, these, uh, so it's been done with colleagues and friends here in Oxford, uh, but also at Pompeo Fabra in uh, Barcelona and with uh, with uh, colleagues at the Imperial College London at the Psychedelic Center. Uh, so our, our motivation was to see whether we can, so uh, unlike Marco, uh, Marcos, that was uh, focusing more on, 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 on experimental designs and then and, and doing uh, the, um, the, the analysis, we wanted to see uh, more how mechanistically we can uh, kind of look and see whether we can predict certain treatment influences in, uh, uh, in various brain states. Uh, here it will be for treatment resistant depression. And just kind of in general, uh, like when we talk of treatment, it can be uh, various different uh, methods, uh, such as deep brain stimulation, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which are external magnetic or electric um, 
we call it perturbations, manipulations of, of the complex system of the brain. Uh, but also it can be more, uh, uh, let's say, simple sensorial inputs that can also uh, propagate through the, through the, through the uh, uh, hierarchies of the brain and, and induce changes. Uh, or it can be, of course, uh, pharmacology, which is the case with uh, psychedelics, psilocybin, for example, and we know that they are very good at mediating through the, through the serotonergic receptors. Um, and neuroreceptors. Uh, so yeah, so and for example, in the con context of the uh, deep brain stimulation, uh, rather than uh, you know relying always on the uh, animal models or uh, neurosurgical empiricism, we would hope that at some point we can have an in silico, a virtual brain, if you may, uh, that we could um, uh, we could uh, perturb, we could try and see whether we can find an optimal uh, optimal uh, incision point uh, that can then alle alleviate certain uh, certain um, conditions and in in our context we looked at the uh, so yeah our goal was to promote a transition uh, in in the treatment resistant uh, uh, depression trial this was a um, data set from imperial college london it says the pilot study of uh, open feasibility study where 15 uh, treatment resistant um, uh, treatment depression uh, depressive patients with treatment resistant depression were collected i think exactly you, you mentioned that there were two uh, yeah, two antidepressant uh, treatments didn't work for them. And these were scanned before and after uh, a psilocybin treatment of low 10 milligram oral dose and high uh, 25 milligrams dose, I believe. And then we have one day uh, fMRI scan. So this is this resting state uh, that Emmanuel was talking about, uh, fMRI, uh, uh, we call it brain state, the spatial temporal dynamics of the brain. And uh, what's interesting is <laughs> Of course, we would uh, we hope that we see 15 responders to this treatment. But in our context, it was very nice to see that uh, we can we can have uh, five weeks after the treatment uh, six responders and uh, and nine non-responders. So that gave us an opportunity to see and explore mechanistically whether we can let's say something about what is about the treatment that works for some patients and doesn't for uh, other patients. Uh, so I've mentioned mechanistic and brain states uh, a lot. Uh, so I guess these are the two ingredients that we need to put together in order to uh, arrive to, uh, to a representation of, uh, of this uh, virtual and silico brain. Uh, the quantitative description of brain state was nicely uh, mentioned by Andrea, where he said it's a one way to look at it, where we can do it through the kind of the harmonic decomposition, for example. But of course, there are uh, various methods. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be speaking slightly about a slightly different, uh, different aspect. And then the unifying mechanistic model is, uh, is a way to, uh, to arrive to a, a again, virtual brain or a representation of a brain that then we can use and then uh, you know, uh, perturb bit by bit to, uh, to see how that can promote a certain, a certain transition between different brain states. Uh, so when talking about uh, brain states, I guess the traditional representation would be we have these scans. And then we, we uh, apply uh, atlases, kind of predefined atlases that, that allow, us, allow us to obtain a regional, if, uh, regional time series of different brain regions. And then, as Emmanuel and many other uh, speakers have uh, discussed, then you can do a, a correlative or a statistical a measure that tells you how much a different brain region talk to each other. And that's what we would call a static functional connectivity. It's a very nice measure because it's very intuitive and gives us a very a rich description of a brain state uh, quantitatively. Uh, I would like to motivate that we need to perhaps go a bit more dynamic because here what we essentially do, we're collapsing time. So we're basically saying, you know, a, a snapshot of a brain is basically a frozen uh, description of, of its functional network. Whereas what we can do, and uh, in this me method, I'll just briefly uh, talk you through it. We do um, uh, something what's called analog signal, uh, which we uh, turn the, the signal into, and then that allows us to have a phase information, uh, as you can see in the polar uh, coordinate, uh, polar plot, and that allows us to obtain an information phase relationship between different brain regions, but unlike in this um, static point, uh, point of view, now we can have every time point in time. And this is really cool, what, because what it means is that every, every snapshot in time, we have a, 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 a pattern of, of connectivity that, uh, that evolves in time. So what we can do with this is then ask ourselves, well, is there, is the, are, they, are there some underlying substates that kind of reoccur in time, that they, they come and go? Uh, and that's what we did uh, through a clustering uh, method. 
And what you can see is that the, 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 uh, the, the, the temporal trajectory arrives to uh, kind of goes towards a certain uh, centroid, which would be the dominant representative substate of this brain state, and then kind of veers off and goes to another one. So we could think of them as metastable uh, substates, that they are not something that the, the brain uh, falls into, but it rather can approximate and then kind of goes to a different state. And then we can summarize them through this, uh, uh, what we call a probabilistic metastable substates, which is a way to say that uh, on average, or there's a probability of a certain substate being active in the in the recording. And so that we take this as a dynamical measure of what the brain state is, and uh, what that's what we and and so we apply this to the to the data set where we had the responders and non-responders before the treatment, as I as I mentioned, and after the treatment. And for the as you can see on the left, for the static measures, there are no differences or we couldn't uh, parse uh, differences between between the patients. Whereas in the in the dynamical sense, there were differences uh, when looking at, in this, in, at this metastable substates between um, between pre and uh, and uh, before and after for the for the for the responders to the treatment, which wasn't the case for the non-responders, and then we saw differences between the responders and non-responders after the treatment, which at the baseline wasn't the case, and that, that gave us a motivation to go further and try to see whether we can model it. And then uh, see whether we can say something about this kind of meta mechanistic uh, causal uh, treatment based uh, uh, approach with the modeling. And that's the, that's the second ingredient, which by this point I hope you've heard at least once from Martin. Maybe, you know, yeah, I think at least so you kind of have a sense of uh, what the different ingredients are when we're talking about having a somewhat unifying a principle that allows us to, to, to build. Uh, uh, a virtual brain, uh, if you may. And so for that, we need the, the anatomical structure, which is basically the, the, the white matter tracks of the brain. At every node of this network, you can describe mathematically a, uh, a regional uh, a representation of the dynamics. So we, we have some uh, expectation that the dynamics will look on the regional level in a certain way. And that's what we do. We, we use uh, the a Hopf model that is a, is a simple bifurcation based uh, model that allows us to have a flexible representation of the different dynamics that one can see in dynamic regimes that one can see in the brain, uh, uh, kind of more noisy based, uh, more oscillatory driven by the intrinsic frequencies. Somewhere in between at the bifurcation point is this fluctuating, somewhat uh, metastable state that has been shown to represent very well the resting state activity of the brain. And then again, the, the last part, this is important, is to fit the, the, this representation of, of, of the brain to the uh, quantitative description of, of the choice of uh, the way we want to de describe the brain state. So in our cases, the probability mental of substates, uh, as, as you can see there. And so this is exactly what we did. And as you can see visually, so what I'm showing you here is, so here you have the responders before and non-responders before uh, the treatment. And when we, uh, when we uh, fit these uh, models uh, to, these, to these descriptions, we get a pretty good fit uh, to, uh, to these conditions, both in the responders and non-responders. And, uh, and the way we do it, we fit this uh, global coupling parameter that seems to be the one that uh, affects uh, or can, can represent, can, can tune well in dynamics. And this is exciting because what we have now is basically a in silico representation of the, the preconditions the, of, of, the, of the patients. And now we can kind of go and, and perturb individually different brain states with different uh, intensities, both for the uh, here for the responders and for the non-responders, and see how the dynamics evolve on the, on the spatial temporal kind of spatial temporal sense, and then compare their PMS uh, descriptions to the healthy state, which is here five minutes, thank you. Which is here represented by the uh, by the uh, treat, um, responders to the treatment, because for whatever reason, in their brain or in their description, uh, spatial control uh, dynamical description, uh, they seem to respond to the psychedelic treatment, and this is what we did, and uh, that's why I'm showing you here, uh, where uh, you have um, the brain regions that we individually kind of perturb and see how they how they unfold. Uh, and then we, uh, on the on the y x axis on the x axis you see this uh, simulation type and intensity on the negative 
it will be simulated with the, with the noisy dynamic regime. This is all the fact that this is also to be said that um, the the model is fixed, and all we are changing is the, the parameters, the local individual parameters of the of the model, every brain brain region. And what this essentially allows us to do is to find uh, an optimal region, as as you can see here in red, where we can see that on average the regions uh, give us a very good description of moving from the responders before the treatments to the uh, to the healthy state, which it's, it's, it's interesting because then you can take this, uh, this uh, region and compare it to the non-responders and see whether in the difference of, of, of within these regions, whether we can see some, some differences that would uh, give us uh, an idea of what is it about the non-responders that uh, doesn't work. And so that's what I'm showing you here when you can rank order the, 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 the brain regions that seem to work in responders to the treatment. But that's not the case uh, for the non responders. We see some, uh, some posterior regions around the temporal parietal junction, and uh, also quite highly ranked, there are some uh, limbic regions such as the uh, amygdala or parahippocampus. So that's very interesting. That kind of warrants uh, further uh, investigation. Uh, and lastly, what we did in the remaining of time uh, was to also, because uh, we know that. Um, that the both the psychedelics are uh, serotonergic agonists uh, or serotonergic neuroreceptor agonists, but at the same time, also the, the depression is being hypothesized to also uh, be, as we heard before, related to the serotonergic release. So we just wanted to see whether there is something about these uh, regions that, uh, that can be reflected in, in, the, in the density maps of these, uh, of these receptors. And what we found very interesting that they seem to be uh, correlated only with the 2A and 1A receptors, which are the, the, the one known to, uh, to be the 2A very much uh, uh, media, the psychedelic experience being mediated through these uh, receptors. But also the 1A seems to be uh, implicated in the, uh, what Robin Carhart called, called the passive coping mechanism uh, in depression. And uh, so, yeah, now just to conclude, um, yeah, so it's just uh, an idea of uh, using these in silico models as a, as a new way for, for, uh, for psychedelic treatment, uh, you know, to different ex uh, explanation of rate state, you would have a different model. Marco, for example, has a nice um, mathematical model that tries to link connectome harmonics as described by, uh, by Andrea. Uh, uh, so, so having a different type of model to this description of the brain, which is also very exciting. And yeah, and so if we can use these models, maybe we can have a more mechanistic evidence of what type of regions might be driving, uh, I guess, in this context, uh, psychedelics, uh, psychedelic treatment, which I think there is a lot of, uh, um, lot of uh, space to, to further explore, because these models can be, can be uh, enhanced by, uh, by a further, like more biologically re relevant parameters that can give us more insight on the uh, on the on, on the on the influences uh, of the psychedelics uh, to the to the different situation, and then yeah, so then hopefully we can extend it to other neuropsychiatric disorders. So thank you very much. Yes, just time. Yes, just some time. <laughs> All right. So uh, now we're in the last talk uh, before the second break. Um, so just a note for the break, um, you're welcome to go back into uh, the Sherrington building. Just please do make sure that you wear a mask whenever you're moving about uh, the buildings. Um, we've just gotten a few emails um, from the department um, reminding us and encouraging us to, to please wear masks indoors. Um, great. And without further ado, um, we've got uh, Ray Rayon, Rayon. Rayon Zafar, um, who's going to be talking about harnessing scientific discovery with clinical equipoise, strengths and pitfalls of psychedelic neuroimaging. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rayan Safar, and I'm a PhD student at the Center for Psychedelic Research and Neuropsychopharmacology at Imperial. And today's talk, I'll be talking to you about harnessing scientific discovery with clinical equipoise and some strengths and pitfalls of psychedelic neuroimaging. So neuropsychopharmacology is a study which describes neurons, which are the fundamental cellular units of the brain in the central nervous system, 
the psyche, which describes the totality of the human mind, the unconscious and the conscious, and pharmacology, which looks at the interaction between chemicals and biochemical properties associated with disorder in humans. It's an extension of a discipline of psychopharmacology, which specifically looks at how drugs interact with the mind, but neuropsychopharmacology particularly wants to know how and why these changes happen. At Imperial, what we conduct are clinical trials in OCD, depression, addiction, anorexia nervosa, and chronic pain. But on top of that, we also want to understand the mechanism of action. So we look at neuroimaging to understand why the treatment outcomes occur. Within these constructs and these studies, there's sometimes a difficulty between the therapeutic intent and the neuroimaging paradigms where therapeutic intent is not the primary objective. Um, however, there is a predominant ethical view that all clinical trials should have therapeutic intent. But what this actually fundamentally boils down to in our trials is something called the therapeutic misconception. And that describes when a research, research subject fails to appreciate the distinction between the imperatives of clinical research and of ordinary treatment that is received in clinical care in society. And therefore, these individuals inaccurately attribute therapeutic intent to research practices. Over the course of this, um, this talk, I want you to consider the different ethics involved, specifically in your imaging in clinical trials, and some of the risks and benefits that these may entail for participants in the context of psychedelic neuroimaging. So first of all, in order to understand neuropathology, we have to understand disorder in the body. And there's several ways that we can uh, earmark disorder or neuropathology. And one of the ways that we can do this is by looking at neurochemicals. So we've heard today about serotonergic deficiencies, which may be underlying depression, but then we also, in addiction, look at dopaminergic deficiencies. Um, so using specific radio traces and comparing between healthy individuals and individuals with addiction, we can quantify receptors in the brain. So dopamine receptors are a target. And what we found from imaging the dopamine receptors in the brain of individuals with cocaine addiction versus healthy controls is that they have fewer receptors in the brain. But the number of receptors in the brain doesn't really tell us much about the function of dopamine, it just says that there are fewer receptors. And so in order to understand and to quantify how much dopamine we have in the brain, there are certain drugs that we can give to people to stimulate dopamine release. And unsurprisingly, these are stimulants. And so what we give to participants inside the scanner is amphetamine drugs. And so this is a powerful stimulant which causes dopamine release in the brain. But in order to quantify in addicts, specifically cocaine addicts, how much dopamine releasing capacity they have, we have to also give them these stimulant drugs. And what we found from these studies is that as well as having lower receptors, these cocaine addicts also have lower dopamine releasing capacity. Using similar sorts of techniques, we can also look at different endophenotypes of addiction. So we can look at in individuals who've got opioid or heroin addiction. And what we've done in this study over here is we looked at the differences in dopamine release in the brain to heroin to understand whether dopamine was the contributing driver towards heroin's reinforcement effects. And what we found that it wasn't. So dopamine doesn't seem to be particularly important in the reinforcement effects of heroin, whereas the stimulant addictions it does. But what we did see when we asked these patients how they felt in the scanner is that they particularly had increases in urging and craving and also felt more increase in intensity levels in terms of withdrawal and also felt high. So one of the fundamental questions or findings that we found is that cocaine and heroin addiction are fundamentally different neurophenotypes Dopamine seems to be driving cocaine addiction and not heroin addiction. But there are also some important clinical considerations from these early findings. Essentially, what we have to do is give stimulants to cocaine addicts and heroin to heroin addicts. And although this gives us an insight into the brain, what we could be doing is perhaps facilitating a further entrenchment or an exacerbation of their condition, or perhaps giving them the possibility of relapse. But these early studies have fundamentally allowed us to develop other paradigms which don't involve pharmacological stimulation. And this specific behavioral uh, paradigm we're developing at Imperial is a roulette task in the scanner. 
Um, what we do and what we've weighted this to do is to give you more reward uh, than losses. And so we call it reward and rich roulette task. And with fMRI, we've been able to see that it activates reward pathways in the brain. Why this is specifically important is because using simultaneous fMRI and PET, we can actually look at the changes in dopamine for the first time in the human brain in response to uh, behaviorally induced tasks. And so you might think, what's this got to do with psychedelics? So we hope to be able to understand whether psilocybin can restore these dopaminergic deficiencies that are observed in individuals with addiction and whether we can actually see a restore of dopamine. So this will be the first molecular account for the restore of dopaminergic deficits in addiction as a result of psilocybin when the results of this study are published. Another powerful way that we can look into the brain is through Q-reactivity. So Q-reactivity describes a process where we provide individuals with addiction images of, of things related to their addiction or the environment that they're in. And what we see more generally across this meta-analysis is that several networks in the brain robustly activate. Um, and this is seen particularly in the salience networks and also executive networks too. What we're interested in Imperial is understanding how this translates into behavioral addictions. And so we're piloting this new fMRI paradigm where we look at individuals' brain responses to gambling cues versus social cues, food and nature cues, which are considered to be rewarding and naturally uh, rewarding stimuli. Recently, uh, we featured in a BBC documentary with an ex-football player called Paul Merson. So Paul Merson paid for Arsenal and also for England, and he's been a gambling addict for most, most of his life. He's lost over £7 million due to his gambling addiction, and he, at the time of this study, had been six months abstinent. So we looked inside Paul's brain to see how his reward systems uh, were reactive to some of these control cues. And so in response to food, we saw no activation in the reward system, equally to social cues, and nature cues, we saw no activation, but in this N equals one study in fMRI, well, we're doing a larger study, but in one patient, what we saw was robust activation following six months of abstinence in the brain regions related to reward and salience. And this is powerful, but more importantly, what we asked Paul after the scanner was how he felt. And he said he felt like he wanted to gamble for the first time in six months. He was visibly unsettled. And he said that it was scary that something like 10 minutes of watching random clips, even if only a few of them being gambling ones could precipitate relapse in him. But what this powerfully shows is that there is aberrant salience processing in addiction. So as I mentioned, can Q exposure derail the therapeutic process in individual, but in relation to psychedelics and treatment response, if we use these paradigms after somebody's taken a psychedelic, so after the therapy has been involved, what we will be able to show is whether psilocybin can restore some of these functional impairments of the brain, but we're not necessarily sure whether they can necessarily be therapeutic or safe uh, for individuals um, with considerations to relapse. So what I've discussed over here is how we can look at the clinical effects of psychedelics in a pre versus post experimental paradigm, but we can also look at the acute effects of psilocybin on the brain. Um, so that's under the influence of psychedelics within a scanner. So in this particular study, they wanted to understand the effects of psychedelics and social exclusion. So social exclusion is prevalent across many psychiatric disorders um, and increased reactivity to this could actually lead to greater pathology. So they wanted to understand whether psilocybin can modulate negative social isolation. And so they developed this fMRI paradigm where a ball is passed between players and essentially you, the participant under psilocybin, don't get past the ball and you are disconnected from the internet. So you're frustrated, isolated, essentially bullied whilst under the influence of magic mushrooms. So what they found was there were brain regions specifically associated with this processing and surprisingly or unsurprisingly, psilocybin reduced the feelings of negative isolation and this was correlated with feelings of unity. So whilst this is powerful and it can show for the first time the relationship between psychedelics acutely and social isolation, essentially it's not the nicest thing to make to be feel socially excluded whilst you're tripping. And it could facilitate, you know, some 
pretty negative experiences. And actually, uh, another study found that experimental settings involving neuroimaging strongly predicts unpleasant and anxious reactions to psilocybin. So perhaps acute measures of psilocybin aren't the best way to model psilocybin more generally. So I'm going to finish with telling you some results which were unpublished, which are quite exciting from our New England Journal of Medicine trial, which was published last year by Robin. So for those of you that don't know, we've done two studies at Imperial College. So the first was an open label study in treatment resistant depression, which is widely regarded as a catalyst for the modern psychedelic renaissance we're witnessing today. But we did a follow up study where we wanted to compare a major depressive disorder, individuals giving two doses of psilocybin versus escitalopram, which is a commonly prescribed SSRI antidepressant. We've also spoken today about the Rebus model, which suggests that the brain in pathological states has these very rigid ways of thinking and neurocomputationally these can be modelled modeled, sorry, by having free energy landscapes which are very rigid and cross-cortical communication has been blunted and that psychedelics can acutely change this by sorry, increasing functional connectivity in the brain and therefore allowing a reset of balance across the board. And so in our first study using this modularity concept, so modularity describes how well connected the brain is. So high levels of modularity mean that the brain isn't very well connected and it's very independently segregated in terms of its communication. Low modularity means that it's communicating with all brain regions and psilocybin robustly showed in the first set of our open label study, it decreases brain modularity. What we also found is that those individuals which had lower brain modularity, so more cortical connection, uh, had lower scores of BDI, so lower depression scores. So it's a good biomarker for depression. And then we also found that those had the greatest changes in modularity, so the greatest decrease, represented by increased functional connectivity in the brain, had the greatest benefit from psilocybin, so the greatest reductions in BDI. So what we also found in our follow-up study, and this is the unpublished and exciting data, is that we followed this up and we found that actually in the psilocybin group, but not the antidepressant group, that modularity was decreased in the brain, and that this decrease was predicted of treatment outcome at six weeks, so it was a prognostic and a diagnostic tool as we heard before and actually these were happening in regions of the brain such as the executive network but quite interestingly and in my line of work with addiction we were seeing these changes in functional connectivity leading to treatment response in areas of the salience network which is a reward network and also regions of the default mode network which we've spoken a lot about today so what we fundamentally have found from this research is that psychedelic drugs change the brain in order to lift depression, which SSRIs do not seem to do. So what I've discussed today more broadly is that we can look at neuropathology in the brain, but sometimes this can be at the detriment to patients and we can give them certain neuroimaging paradigms that can precipitate withdrawal or exacerbate their conditions. However, these functional and pet imaging paradigms are powerful ways to assess the mechanism of action in the brain of psychedelics, which has not been done as extensively up until now. We can also look at the acute impacts of psychedelics in the brain, but we can also understand that perhaps these aren't the best models to model psychedelics from. And then finally, we've been able to prove some computational models which show the power of neuroimaging. And I think neuroimaging more broadly allows us to have confidence in a specific mechanism or confidence in a therapy because it's great to understand clinical outcome, but as scientists and doctors and even regulators knowing why and how will fundamentally get this through to the market. So I'm gonna finish on a quote from Aldous Huxley. He says, orthodoxy is a diehard of the world of thought. It learns not, neither does it forget. And a piece of advice from the director of our center, Professor David Nutt. He said, all researchers need to make a specific effort to avoid being embalmed into the orthodox consensus. I'd like to thank all of the team at Imperial. Some of them are not on that picture, but they're all instrumental to a lot of the work that we've discussed today. Um, and I'd also like to highlight the Cypress Clinic, uh, which is our new the first NHS psychedelic research clinic uh, in the UK, which is now open, which many of our studies are running out of.
And if you have any more questions, you can email me. I'm on Twitter, but thanks for listening.